Dan Lanning got his signature win as Oregon's head coach against Utah. We're breaking that down and talking about much more on today's episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast, your premier podcast for all things Oregon football and recruiting. Just in case you're new here, I'm your host, Max Torres. Excited to have you along for another episode of the pod. Whether you're listening to us on podcast or watching us on YouTube at Oregon Football Max Torres, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show wherever you're listening Leave me a comment and let me know how you're feeling about this Oregon program following that big win over Utah in Salt Lake City. So, Dan Lanning gets his signature win as Oregon football's head coach. Now, he's only in, mind you, his second full season with the Ducks. He's one of the youngest head coaches in the country. There's a lot ahead of him. But what he did this past weekend and, in effect, what Oregon did was remarkable because, yeah, I get it. Utah was banged up with injuries, right? They've been, I don't know, like one of the most injury-riddled teams in the entire country. And I'm not saying that didn't make it easier for Oregon to do what they did on Saturday marching into Salt Lake City and dominating en route to a 35-6 to victory. But let's be honest, Kyle Whittingham is the best coach in the Pac-12. And what can you expect? What have you come to expect from Kyle Whittingham? That's a dude who has his teams ready every single week. And they were able to come up with a huge win over USC the week prior, uh, with, with Bryson Barnes marching the Utes down the field to kick a game-winning field goal as time expired against the Trojans, uh, whose season completely seems to be going off the rails, needing 50 points to beat Cal. But that's another discussion. So Kyle Whittingham's teams are always ready to go. They're well-coached, they're disciplined, um, they're physical. And Oregon went into Salt Lake City and just took all the air out of that stadium, all of it. I mean, the fact that they were 6-1, and the Utes were going into that game, was remarkable in and of itself. But Oregon and Washington, sorry, Oregon and and Utah has always been a battle. It's not necessarily a rivalry, but it's one of the better matchups you get on the Pac-12 schedule. Not every year, right, because they were in the Pac-12 North and the Pac-12 South, but they've given us some really good games. And I'm sorry, I'm a little bright here. I really do need to get some blackout curtains. I got a, I got some blinds right next to me, um, but we will hopefully work on that and get that improved here in the future. But wanted to get on here and give you guys a, a little podcast. Um, in case you haven't already, go ahead and listen to yesterday's episode of the podcast. Uh, went really in depth on Elijah Rushing, five star edge rusher committing to Oregon. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on YouTube as well. So really fun to kind of just hop back and forth between recruiting and football. But I really think this is Dan Landing's signature win uh, because Oregon hasn't won in Salt Lake City since 2016. And they had an 18-game win streak at home. I think it was even longer than that with uh, with fans in the stands, right? Because we had COVID before um, and, and you were playing a whole season with, with no fans in the stands. But Utah is probably the best home field advantage in the Pac-12. I think you can put Oregon and Washington in there as well, uh, at least in that conversation. But not a lot of teams go into Salt Lake City and win. And last year, the Ducks won at home 20-17. to That was back when the Ducks had, or the, the Utes had Cam Rising. He got shut down for the season after that win over USC. So, the fact that Oregon played the level of football that they did on the road in one of the most hostile environments in the Pac-12 and in the country 
I think speaks a tremendous amount to what Dan Lane is doing right now as the head coach, just having his guys locked in and helping, you know, getting them to the point of being able to execute the way that they did on offense and on defense. We're we're looking at what Bo Nix was able to do in this game against Utah. And it wasn't like a crazy game, but in the environment that it came in and just how locked in and focused he was, 24 for 31, 248 yards and two touchdowns through the air. And then he also had four carries for eight yards and one touchdown on the ground. I think one of my favorite Bonix plays was that uh, that passing touchdown to to Jordan James, where he audible uh, at the line of scrimmage pre-snap, and like he was like it was like a a very a very uh, I don't want to say dramatic but animated audibles. You know he 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 clearly saw something, and you could tell that once he got his guys set up, it was just going to be like there money. And then what is it? A Jordan James Texas route over the middle, wide open, touchdown Oregon. So he looks like he's locked in on a different level. And I was just doing some some uh, preview stuff with our Cal reporter, uh, Jake Curtis. So go over and check out Cal Sports Report for those videos. Uh, they'll probably be up sometime soon. But he was asking me about what makes Bo Nix different from last year. And I really think he is just a year smarter and a year better you are seeing the benefits of having the most experienced quarterback in the history of college football. So Bo Nix is just operating at a crazy, crazy clip. I think he's completing 78.3% of his passes, which is just phenomenal. Uh, He is number four in the Heisman Trophy odds, according to FanDuel. I wrote that story on Monday. So Bo Nix is a huge part uh, of what Oregon's doing. Obviously, they're going to go as far as he can take them. He's the quarterback. He's the face of the team. Uh, but he is 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 really really playing some good football. Got to talk about Bucky Irving too. 14 carries for 83 yards and a touchdown. Also caught four passes for 36 yards. Bucky Irving's special. He runs hard. We know that he's incredibly creative. I, I really thought that run that got inside like the one that Bo Nix ran in on the next play was a touchdown. Just showing off his balance and you know, just the strength, being able to take hits as he's falling and, and stay up. Bucky Irving just puts on a show, man. And he he is someone that really deserves to be, I think, mentioned in the conversation of the best running backs in the country. But he's not in the SEC, and he's not the biggest back. So he kind of tends to get put by the wayside. But he deserves all the respect in the world and then some because he is playing some really good football. And then look at what the Ducks were able to do with some of their receivers. Troy Franklin, eight catches for 99 yards and a touchdown. Two really uncharacteristic drops in that game. That's certainly not like Troy, but he has been able to continue just being productive and finding the end zone. Um, Tez Johnson, he had one of his better games of the year, six catches for 51 yards. And I thought it was interesting how they started the game really relying and leaning on the pass. I uh, wasn't really expecting that because I thought they were going to want to win the battle at the line of scrimmage, which they did. But since they got the ball to start the game, I thought they were going to try to to uh, have them, you know, deliver that opening punch. But that's not what they wanted to do. So you got some production from him. You got some production from Treshawn Holden, who got in the end zone. They actually uh, recorded that one as a run play. And um, Terrence Ferguson caught a pass, some, a really important pass at that, you know, late late in the game. Um, that was just kind of some, some cool fireworks. Patrick Herbert caught a pass. And then uh, the tight ends continue to do their thing blocking. So it was just a really a clinic offensively. Um, you did see five punts from Ross James, so it wasn't like they were scoring constantly, but 35 points on the road against Utah, one of the the best defense in the conference. That's a statement. That is absolutely a statement. And I think I I first talked about it being a statement win, but now the more I think about it, it really does feel like it's a signature win for Dan Lanning in his tenure at Oregon. And it's just cool to think about because I remember doing a, 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 record prediction with Spencer McLaughlin over on locked on ducks. I'm sure a lot of you guys listen and watch him, but, and I, and I said, I I think Utah, that Utah game, I think that Dan Lanning and the ducks are going to come away with a win there. 
and I also saw them losing to Washington. So doing doing all right as far as predictions and everything go. But for him to go into Salt Lake City, something that Mario Cristobal couldn't do as a head coach at Oregon and come away with this win and do it in dominant fashion shows that not only is he a really good head coach, Ducks have a really good team. I think a lot of people knew that, but maybe there was a little bit of a question because you lose to Washington. Some people, not everyone's going to react to that game the same way, right? Um, But this game, I think, answered so many questions that people had about this Oregon team and what they're truly capable of. We knew the game against Washington was a big one, and we knew that this game against Utah was a big one. Both of those ones came on the road. Even though the Ducks lost that Washington game, they still put up over 30 points in a hostile environment. And what do they do just a couple weeks later? Again, more than 30 points in a hostile environment, probably the toughest place to play in the Pac-12. Ducks do a really good job at Autzen, but I think we can most people can agree that Rice Eccles is, is where it's at. So I'm not trying to hype up Utah a whole lot here, but I think that the Ducks just also did a really good job playing a clean game. I don't think penalties were a major issue. Let me see if I can find the the stat here about how many penalties they had and, and you know how that maybe factored into the equation here. Of course, I uh, can't find it. Oh, there we go. Penalties. All right, Oregon had eight penalties. For 58 yards, Utah had three for 25. So I guess not as good as I thought it was, but 6.7 yards per play, uh, eight yards per pass, 5.3 yards a carry. And to do that against a Utah defensive front uh, is incredibly impressive. Um, They kept Bo Nix upright the entire game uh, against, I think his name is Jonah Ellis, and he was uh, the number one, he was the sack leader and the Pac-12. So there's a lot of really good stuff that we can say about this Oregon team and what they were able to do. Uh, They got two sacks uh, on defense, which is obviously really, really, uh, really big. And those came from Kyrie Jackson and and Keon Ware Hudson. So tip of the cap to them. Kyrie Jackson also had another tackle for loss. So they're just getting contributions from so many different guys, different positions, and just the depth that Dan Lanning has been able to instill in this team is, is really, really impressive. And I think that one of the reasons I'm so impressed by the job that he's done is because of really, I think the, the growth from the defense because good offenses at Oregon have really become the norm even though Oregon had a new offensive coordinator coming in with Will Stein, your expectations didn't change. You still knew that this was an Oregon team with a veteran quarterback, a lot of talent on the O-line, even though some of them were young. You had some returners. You had some guys that come in from the portal. You had really good running backs coming back. You had Troy Franklin, who's very much deserving of potentially the best wide receiver in the Pac-12. And yes, I'm talking about being on the same level as those guys at Washington, Roma Dunze and Jalen McMillan. So, so you expected Oregon's offense to be good. You know, you had some things you had to figure out, but no major concerns, no major question marks. But then you look at that defense and that side of the ball left a lot to be desired in 2022. I think you had some exciting plays every now and then. You had some good performances. I mean, the the game against Utah last year was probably the best defensive performance that they had. I think you had turnovers. You had, um, you know, containing uh, an elite quarterback and Cam Rising. But that was the best defensive performance, I think, that Oregon turned in all year. And now this group has taken a leap in so many regards. I know Dan Lanning was talking last night about just where they've improved and maybe some stuff that doesn't show up on the stat sheet and missed tackles was one of them. So they're just playing more fundamentally sound football. I think that they are pressuring the quarterback at a much higher rate. I think they have 27 sacks on the year. They only had 18 a year ago in 2022. 
And a big part of that is because of personnel, talent acquisition. This is exactly why I love recruiting because it's the lifeblood of a program, program, but it's also how you go about building your teams. Where do you look at your roster and say, okay, we have some really talented prep guys that can come in and contribute for us, but maybe at this position, we need to have some more veteran experience. And I think you see a little bit of a blend of both on defense. When you're looking at the defensive line, they bring in Jordan Birch from South Carolina, and and they already look like they are well on their way to getting the most out of him. Um, I loved what he did against Utah in defending the run. And I think that is part of what can make him a very special player. You don't want him to just be an edge rusher that can get after the passer and create some gener- generate some pass rush. That's good. NFL teams need that. But what makes a great edge rusher, a great defensive end, is someone who can do both. Someone who can get after the passer and someone who isn't afraid to get their nose in there, uh, split a double team, and and um, mix it up in the run game. Like that. That's what I think is making Kayvon Thibodeau such a special player. His run defense wasn't really talked about too much coming out of Oregon, but he did get better as his college career went on at defending the run. And then now, I mean, he's, I think he's put on some weight. It looks like at least since he got to the NFL, he had three sacks against the jets uh, on Sunday and he has eight and a half on the year. I want to say. So Jordan Birch is just another guy that I think is going another feather in Dan Lenning's cap. He's still a work in progress, right? He's not a finished guy at all. You still have some quality games this year. Maybe he even comes back in 24. I don't think that's an expectation right now, but it's a possibility. But Jordan Birch is a veteran that you needed. It's it's not easy to find edge rushers in the portal. Jordan Birch was pretty much the clear cut number one edge rusher, I think. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think he was the clear cut number one edge rusher that was available in the portal. Boom, Dan Lanning goes out and gets him. But it wasn't just him. You also signed a number of really, really good edge rushers and defensive ends from the prep ranks. And three of the five edge rushers that Oregon signed are playing a huge role as true freshmen. Mateo Uyunglele, I feel like we're talking about him uh, every week. You know, he has become a mainstay in the rotation. Tatum Tuioti has been tremendous. Uh, you know, coming out of Sheldon and, and I think really kind of flying under the radar as a recruit. He's obviously going to get some, some more hype because his dad's a college coach, but I, I mean, he, he's proving that that's not the only reason he was getting recruited by schools. He's show, he's showing every week to some degree, maybe it's not always a sack, but he's showing that he belongs exactly where he is. He had four tackles last week, and and that was good for fifth on the team. So he's been great. And then Blake Purchase is another guy that is impressing. True freshman out of Colorado, Cherry Creek. So the, the, the contributions that they're getting from true freshmen, I think, is a really big reason why they're able to be a deeper, more well-rounded and dangerous defense. And then you look at what they're getting in the back end from Kyrie Jackson, Jaleel Florence. And then you have guys who have played a lot of quality football behind them in Triquez Bridges and uh, and Dante Manning. Um, and, and look, at we also have to talk about what's happening at safety because the, the Ducks are without what I kind of think and what some other people probably regard as their best safety in Brian Addison. Uh, he's still away from the team for personal reasons, it looks like. So... That's resulted in Taishim Johnson and, and Steve Stevens being called upon more. And Evan Williams had a tremendous game. Uh, he had seven total tackles, half a tackle for loss in that game. And they they just are able to get so creative with their play calls and what they do with this defense. Um, Justin Jacobs has been another uh, another great player on this team only a second game of the year uh, against Utah he had three total tackles Jeffrey Bossa was someone that Dan Lanning was incredibly complimentary of on his Monday night Cal Presser as just the 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 guy who gets the defense lined up 
Um, he's got his body right. And then Brandon Dorless is another guy who's playing well. He had a tackle for loss in that Utah game. So I think it's, it's one thing to assemble a talented roster. And it's another thing to coach it, coach it right. Get all you can out of a group of guys and get all those guys playing for each other. I think that's one part of the game that maybe just isn't talked about enough. And that's why I love the behind the scenes access that we've gotten to this Oregon team this year, because you can just see how guys are around each other in the locker room, uh, behind the scenes in the team building stuff. Like there are so many things you have to do at a high level as a head coach to get the most out of your team, to have a team that is in the conversation for a, a league championship and ultimately right we're having the first college football playoff rankings revealed tonight on tuesday depending on when you're watching this but to get a team playing at a level to be in the consideration for a college football playoff spot and it's it's so interesting to look at the conversation now with oregon and washington because they've very clearly separated themselves as the two best teams in this conference washington's undefeated oregon only has one loss Oregon State took their second loss of the year to Arizona, which looks really dangerous. And I bet Oregon fans are happy that they don't have to play the Wildcats this year. Um, but Oregon lost that game by three points. And if if some of those, maybe even one of those fork down conversions goes their way, if they take the points at the half, maybe it's a different conversation. We can play the hypothetical game all we want. But I think the growing feeling and the growing agreement around Oregon and Washington is that I don't want to say Oregon's the better team because it just sounds weird to say that with Washington winning the head to head. But Oregon is every bit as good as Washington. They certainly have a better defense. They've certainly been more consistent after Washington beat Oregon. They almost lost to Arizona State at home. And then the week after that, they follow it up with a scare on the road in Palo Alto against Stanford, which is one of the worst teams in the Pac-12. So anybody can get had at any week. The win that Washington has one of the best wins in college football, right? That's the fact of the matter over Oregon. But look at the consistency that you've seen from this Oregon team. I think that is huge. And that is a big part of the reason why... You know, I think there's growing dialogue and growing feeling that Oregon is better than Washington, but we're not really going to be able to say that definitively, I guess, until they potentially meet again. So that's why so many people have December 1st, Friday, December 1st, circled on their calendar because that's when the Pac-12 championship is going to be played. Look, Oregon's got four games left. It's still a, a tough part of their schedule. They got Cal this week. Cal's offense looks night and day different than in the past um, with, with Jay excuse me, with Jade Knott and uh, Fernando Mendoza. Um, you know, defense maybe doesn't look too great. Look at what Cal was able to do, but Cal has one of the better offenses in the country. So you got Cal at home this week, and then you have USC at home next week. Their defense looks awful, and or who knows what Oregon's offense is going to be able to do to them. But then you also have, um, who else do you have? You have Cal, USC, uh, and then you have... There's got to, oh, Arizona State. Um, I mean, they're, they're not winning a lot of games, but Kenny Dillingham is getting a lot out of that team. So trips to the desert are never easy. And then you have Oregon State at home to wrap up the regular season. So this is Dan Lenning's signature win for now. He's a young coach, and there's still some really tough matchups on the schedule. Um, you know, being able to slow down an offense that is as, as explosive as USC is not going to be easy. Um, I think I'm going to be really interested to see what they're able to do defensively against USC and how that lines up, how that compares to what they were able to do against Washington. Cause there were some good, you know, there's some good, some good from that game. Jaleel Florence had an interception, right? Michael Penix has done a pretty good job taking care of the ball, but you put up 36 points. So I think the question mark there in that USC game is just what the ducks are going to be able to do defensively. I don't think that's much of a question about are they going to be able to keep up with USC from the scoring side of things, but then going onto the desert, it, like the, the desert has not been very kind to Oregon uh, over the past couple of years. So 
Dan Lanning already proved that they can win in Utah, which I think gives you confidence that they should be able to handle their business in Arizona in uh, at Arizona State in Tempe. And then you come back home and play Oregon State for – it seems like it's not going to be the last time, but we know that they're going to be in different conferences. Um, maybe Oregon State's going to be in the pack too. Who knows? Um, but Dan Lenny talked about, you know, we're a good team, but they're trying to go from that good to great, right? And I think a big part of that – I'm trying to paraphrase here because I can't remember exactly what he said, but you find out if you're a great team, I think he said something along those lines, in November. The games in November mean more. Um, we know if, if Oregon picks up a second loss, then that's going to really change uh, the trajectory of their season. But for now, Dan Lanning has done a phenomenal job coaching this team this year. Say what you will about the fourth down attempts and uh, the, the conversions or lack thereof. Dan Lanning has this team playing better in, I, I want to say, almost every facet than they were last year. Uh, special teams look like they're uh, they're improved. Ross James had to punt five times in this game last week against Utah. He had five punts that totaled 250 yards, and he averaged 50 yards a punt with a long of 58, one touchback, and one punt inside the 20. If your punter is averaging 50 yards a kick, that is great. That is where you want to be because you're almost flipping the field, right? If you're going over 50 yards, then you're flipping the field. So special teams are improved as well. Um, I think really you just – that, that fumble that Bucky had, that was tough, but it was important, the response that you saw from Oregon after that Bucky Irving fumble. And then you, I just want to keep an eye on the penalties too. You don't want that to continue to pop up. You don't want that to be a problem for you. You're at home these next two weeks against Cal and USC. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to play a very clean uh, pair of games at home in Austin Stadium. So there's, there's some really good football that's played, but I love how Dan Lanning is managing his temperament, managing – just the, the the mindset of his team, of his guys. You guys have done well, but man, we got some big football ahead of us. And that is why he says that the, the next game is always the most important one. So they got Cal this week. We'll talk some more about that one, I bet. Um, maybe have a recruiting episode for you guys next. We'll see. But uh, make sure you lock in with me on all social media platforms. I'm at mTourist Sports on Twitter and, uh, and Instagram. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already at M Taurus at Oregon Football Max Taurus. It's free. We're on the road to 3K, and I love the support that I've seen from you guys. And you can read all my stuff over at ducksdigest.com. That'll do it for me in today's episode. But uh, until next time, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.